This monster's review video features clips from Tosh.0 and may include sensitive topics. Viewer discretion is advised. Enjoy! Growing up, a part of me wanted to be edgy and constantly attempt to get the attention of others by making them laugh with raunchy jokes. Who can relate? My primary influence for that behavior was none other than Comedy Central. I'd be lying if I said that channel didn't play a big part in shaping my sense of humor today. After all, it is the central of comedy. <laughs> the Colbert Report, Workaholics, Nathan For You, Chappelle's Show, and especially Tosh.0 are among some of the shows that I really connected with. By the way, it was a joke! I know it's pronounced Tosh.0, I'm not that stupid. In August, I was sad to learn that Comedy Central pulled the plug on Tosh.0, leaving a 12th and final season to air throughout the rest of this year. It was amusing reading through the online discourse surrounding this decision because so many people didn't even know that it was still in production. To be fair, I don't watch cable at all anymore, so beyond a few YouTube clips here and there, the last time I tuned into the show was probably 2018. But having not watched it in a while, this rather depressing announcement sort of reignited my interest in it. I dug up my old Tosh.0 physical media and gave those a watch, went through hours of videos on the Tosh.0 YouTube channel, and searched the World Wide Web to read whatever I could about the series. I know this is kind of different from my normal content, and apologies if this isn't something you're interested in, but personally, I found that I have a lot more to say about this show than I initially thought. So strap in and get ready for this internet video where I wax poetic about a show roasting internet videos. For those uninitiated, you're probably wondering what Tosh.0 even is. Well, on the official website, it says, Tosh.0 is a weekly topical series hosted by comedian Daniel Tosh that delves into all aspects of the internet, from the ingenious to the absurd to the medically inadvisable. Think of it as an R-rated version of America's Funniest Home Videos, because Tosh.0 is anything but inoffensive fun for the family. You'll find a variety of clips on the show. People hurting themselves, people eating things they shouldn't eat, overall doing things that most would consider shameful. The show, which was created by Tosh and writer-producer Mike Gibbons, premiered in 2009 and quickly garnered mainstream success. It's kind of a miracle that this show caught on like it did because Comedy Central seems to have these giants that have been going on forever and rarely does a new show stick around to join them. Although Tosh.0 has been on the air for a long time, the overall format has generally remained the same. It's filmed with Daniel standing on a green screen stage, so in the final product you see a virtual set. There's a live studio audience for each taping to provide reactions for the clips and jokes, and I was actually signed up to attend one of the tapings this year, before we found ourselves in this current predicament. A running gag that's been with the show since its start is that Daniel sticks with a fashion theme for each half or third of a season. For instance, the first half of season 6 was referred to as the Season of Brad, where Daniel would dress up as a different Brad Pitt character for each episode. Then, in the latter 15 episodes of season 6, he wore grey outfits in a theme called Fifteen Shades of Grey, in reference to that one Twilight fanfiction. The show is usually broken up into four blocks. The first block serves as a general introduction, where about half a dozen clips are lined up and Daniel jokes about each one. It's kind of like a monologue from late night shows, where it's just joke after joke after joke. It ends with the video breakdown, where he highlights a longer clip and commentates over it. The second block is the featured segment of the show, the piece de resistance. This segment is primarily the web redemption, where Daniel shows a popular video, flies the people from the video to Hollywood, interviews them, and attempts to redeem them by redoing the mishap or embarrassment from the original video in a better fashion. As of recent, the featured segment has frequently been called the Celebrity Profile, which is basically the web redemption, but it's more of a standard interview with silly skits. Then the third and fourth blocks are a little more random. Sometimes Daniel and his crew will recreate their own version of an internet trend, like Angry Birds except they're actually throwing birds at people. They also include some interactive segments with Daniel's Twitter followers and a viewer video of the week that people can submit on their website. Rounding out the episode, Daniel takes the remaining time to tease the next episode and plug his social media, upcoming stand-up performances, and projects he's involved with. So that's a basic rundown of what Tosh.0 is all about. It's a fairly straightforward clip show that makes fun of things on the web. What about that is so special? To be honest, I don't know. But I will explain why it struck a chord with me. Let's go. 
Daniel is an incredibly versatile and funny host. When your show concept is as simple as commentating over clips, you need someone who's charismatic and committed to lead the way. Since he was a teenager, Daniel has been doing stand-up comedy on a regular basis, and from witnessing his expressiveness and wit, you can clearly tell he's experienced. As a presenter, he kind of takes on the role of an arrogant, snarky internet commenter, and with his rapid-fire, sarcastic delivery, makes a fool out of whoever he's talking about. This is especially demonstrated in the frequent segment, 20 Seconds on the Clock, where he pretends to leave as many joking comments as he can in that amount of time. Daniel puts on an egotistic, sexually ambiguous persona, and it makes him an undeniably strange figure. He's willing to show vulnerabilities and put all of himself out there, hence the regular occurrence of him being naked and wearing scantily clad outfits. Rarely ever do I go a minute watching this show and not laugh, because in both the physical and verbal comedy, Tosh.0 is a treasure trove of mockery that pushes the envelope. A part of Daniel's persona is that he's ruthless and non-politically correct. As such, this show isn't for everyone, because he often makes light of misfortune and jokes almost exclusively at the expense of others for shock value. It makes sense that there's a disclaimer before every episode saying it's intended for a mature audience. Sometimes he jokes about stereotypes, sometimes he jokes about hard truths, and sometimes he says something so outrageous you don't know whether to laugh or take the sting of discomfort. There are absolutely jokes that haven't aged well at all, especially in the first few seasons, but I think it's important to make the distinction that it's from an edgy facade. Because he isn't explicitly playing a character and brands the show under his own name, some people may confuse Daniel for being insensitive in real life. But I think he's illustrated in several instances that the bogus things he says on stage under the guise of comedy aren't necessarily the same as his personal beliefs. It seems like he's toned down a lot of that stuff anyway, and when he goes too far, he'll apologize. Simply labeling yourself as a comedian definitely shouldn't give you an excuse to say absolutely anything, no matter how awful or problematic it is, but context is key, and this show provides that. Christopher Columbus wrote about seeing mermaids, but he also thought America was India and committed mass genocide. Not what I'd call a trustworthy source. <laughs> While Daniel definitely portrays an exaggerated and altered version of himself, he still includes tidbits from his life to make things more personable. He'll often bring up the fact that he's from the crazy state of Florida, a huge fan of the Miami Dolphins, and his hatred for Alabama, especially the Crimson Tide football team and their coach Nick Saban. Two words you do not want to say in front of Mr. Tosh are Roll Tide. He'll go on tangents about this stuff in the middle of his show for no particular reason other than that he just feels like it. And as a non-football fan, I can appreciate that he's talking from a place of passion, even if I don't understand what he's talking about. A lot of the time, the convergence of internet and television can feel gimmicky. In the past few years, I think some traditional media, like talk shows and late-night television, have made an increased effort to acknowledge the role and impact of the internet. More so now than ever, since we've all found ourselves having to produce more content in a virtual capacity. It's nice that they've begun to realize the internet is a legitimate source of talent and activity, and who knows, maybe it's because their metrics are falling behind as online audiences continue to grow. But trust me when I say it always hasn't been that way. For a long time, it seemed like corporate media and big news outlets had an agenda to dismiss online content creation as unimportant and discredit the success of it all. The word YouTuber had an extremely negative connotation, and it still kinda does. Where Tosh falls into this equation is that his show serves as a platform for these outcasts of the internet on a big corporate cable channel. Back in the day, if you got on Tosh.0, or even if your stuff got posted to his blog, it was a huge deal. It was a form of validation from a side of the industry that largely refused to recognize communities on the internet at all. Granted, Daniel is focused on showing more of the not-so-glamorous examples of hijinks that ensue on the web, which doesn't exactly paint a good picture. However, I've always viewed him as an ambassador of sorts for web culture because he holds it in a fair regard. He shows different sides of it and doesn't always try to maintain a high ground, and of course he'll make fun of people, but I never got the impression that he's speaking down to internet creators as peasants. Also, he's usually in on the joke. Literally. Daniel will frequently insert himself through the magic of green screen directly into one of these crazy videos. Or even better, he'll have his art department recreate the location into a set with props to do it on his own. It's elaborate, they hire models, extras, low-grade comedians, and he likes to feature his writers and crew as well. One of my favorite bits from the entire show is when Daniel convinced a member of his staff to eat the Swedish delicacy Sir Stroming, which, if you don't know, is one of the most putrid-smelling foods on the planet. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
So Daniel is a talented host, his jokes are funny, and he embraces the internet, which overall makes it a fun show to watch. But how does that stack up against shows with a similar format? Well, I think we should start with the one it's compared to the most. MTV's Ridiculousness. In case you didn't know, MTV and Comedy Central are both owned by Viacom CBS, so both of these shows are distributed from the same parent company. I actually watched a lot of ridiculousness in preparation for this video, and it was pretty easy as it just so happened to be on MTV whenever I had time to watch it. And funny enough, I regularly saw promos for the new season of Tosh.0 during commercial breaks. I do want to make it clear that ridiculousness is fine entertainment. It's a great show to watch when you just want to turn your brain off. It's nothing complex, just some mindless fun and run-of-the-mill content. Having said that, I don't think it stands anywhere close to Tosh in quality. I like to think of Ridiculousness as nothing more than a Vine compilation with added production value. It's skateboarder turned reality star Rob Dyrdek plus two of his friends and a random celebrity sitting on a couch pointing and hysterically laughing at montages of people acting reckless on camera. Pure schadenfreude. Rob's always making these casual remarks and pointing out the obvious of what's happening in the clip while a digital crosshair effect pops up on the screen and Chanel West Coast endlessly cackles in the background. If you've seen one episode, it feels like you've seen them all. I'm just not a big fan of the overreactions and constant laughing at things that aren't even that funny. And looks back over and all the cereal has like floated away and it's just like a bowl of milk. You know what I mean? I don't know. <laughs> It couldn't be any more apparent that there's not a lot of thought going into the show either when they pump out episodes like Nobody's Business. In recent seasons, they've been producing episodes at a rate of well over 100 per year, and they'll regularly shoot more than six episodes in a given day. With their extremely low maintenance format and schedule of shooting episodes back to back, it's gotta be ridiculously cheap to produce this show. And it's gotta be making insane amounts of profit with its good ratings, high frequency of reruns, and the over a dozen spin-offs and localized adaptations of the show that have been made around the world. To avoid this video from devolving into a full-fledged rant on ridiculousness, the comment I'm trying to make is that Tosh.0 has substance and ridiculousness doesn't. For shows like Ridiculousness, I don't think the audience gives a rat's patootie about the cast and various personalities that are reacting to the clips. They care about the clips themselves, that's the main source of comedy in the show. Whereas, in the case of Tosh.0, the comedy comes from everything surrounding the clips. The videos are paused a lot of the time, and Daniel merely uses them as a springboard to create his own jokes. He and his team are dynamic, and instead of pointing out the obvious and making inoffensive remarks, they lean towards being more risky. For instance, in a clip where a girl starts aggressively vomiting on an amusement ride, Daniel points out that the other person on the ride has a Mumford & Sons shirt, and uses that as an opportunity to compare their music to the vomit. Being more unconventional probably makes the show less promotable, but I'll almost always prefer media that's more risky than ordinary. Now, in fairness, the stars of Ridiculousness don't call themselves comedians, but if they're not providing unique insight or hilarious humor that's more important than the clips, it makes you wonder what actual purpose they serve on the show. It's like Chrissy Teigen on Lip Sync Battle. No disrespect to Chrissy Teigen, but her role on Lip Sync Battle boils down to dancing during performances and occasionally chiming in with a silly bit that's clearly planned out by producers. Adding insult to injury, I watched a video where Rob Dyrdek talks to Larry King and basically says that the only reason he pursued ridiculousness in the first place was because he read an article about how lucrative the syndication business of America's Funniest Home Videos was. I just gotta shoot it in the studio, so easier to do, and if I get to 100 episodes, I've got a global syndication, I'll get paid forever, right? Speaking of other shows, the other show Tosh gets compared to a lot is Ease the Soup. I'm not nearly as familiar with The Soup as I am with the stuff I already mentioned, but from what I've seen, it focuses more on pop culture and reality TV than viral internet videos, and Joel McHale's approach to presenting was more dry and deadpan. There was a show on Comedy Central called At Midnight that I used to enjoy watching, and while it was about the internet, it was more of a game show than it was commentary. <laughs> Beyond that, there have been plenty of internet clip shows that have come and gone throughout the years, hoping to get a sliver of the success that the obsolete America's Funniest Home Videos has. Among them are The World's Funniest Moments, Ain't That America, True TV's Top Funniest, and my personal favorite, Upload with Shaquille O'Neal. Amidst all of these, Tosh stands out because he took what in this day and age is a stale format and made it different. Tosh.0 is in every sense of the word transformative. And that brings us to the present. On August 20th, 2020, Comedy Central announced that they cancelled Tosh.0, just one day after announcing their cancellation of Drunk History, which was another well-regarded show on the channel. 
Tosh.0 was actually picked up for four more seasons at the beginning of the year, with each consisting of 20 episodes, and that would have brought us to 2024, but Comedy Central decided to change their mind. While there was no official reason stated for why the show was cancelled, it's easy to speculate. Starting with the obvious, the pandemic, in one way or another, almost definitely played a role in its cancellation. But the principal offender seems to be a case of executives playing musical chairs at Viacom CBS. What I mean by saying this is that the company is restructuring, so people in the upper echelon who make important decisions are leaving, and as a result, new people with new motives are joining. Thus, under new creative influence, the company is attempting to redefine its identity. The two bigwigs at Comedy Central who crafted that four-season deal for Tosh.0 in January are no longer with Comedy Central. The channel is in kind of a weird limbo phase right now because if you look at their schedule, a good portion of it is made up of syndicated reruns from shows they didn't even make, like The Office and The Cleveland Show. Comedy Central has received quite a bit of publicity in recent months for announcing that they have a bunch of not-so-fresh animated shows in the works. There's Jody, a spin-off of Daria that could be promising, the utterly unnecessary Beavis and Butthead reboot 2.0, and last, but definitely least, the horribly disgraceful Ren and Stimpy reboot. Please cancel it. A key point of the network's new strategy is to focus on providing more adult animation. Now, I'll be one of the first to step up and advocate for animation and say, yes, any additional recognition for animation is fantastic. The more, the merrier. But... They shouldn't have to cancel good live-action shows to accommodate for it, especially if they're trying to make room for some reboots nobody was really asking for. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Traditionally, Comedy Central hasn't exactly had a great track record with its original animated programs, and they tend not to last long either. As fellow YouTuber Johnny Tuchello's pointed out in this tweet, Comedy Central has aired a total of 14 original animated programs. South Park, a single show, has lasted for 23 seasons, while the number of combined seasons from the 13 other animated shows just barely passes it at 27. Daniel Tosh even commented on Comedy Central's new direction by saying in a statement, I look forward to doing an animated reboot of my show on MTV in 25 years. As well as tweeting, After 12 years together, Comedy Central and I are consciously uncoupling. They get the cartoons and I'm heading to any network with stronger Wi-Fi. As I've been working on this video, the new season of Tosh has started premiering, and I've watched the first few episodes. The first thing we see is Daniel in front of a black background with a mask dangling off his ear, providing context for how the season will play out. The first episode and some of the bits spread throughout were filmed pre-apocalypse, but everything else is filmed with proper precautions and no studio audience. Ironically enough, Daniel's theme for this season is the season of mourning. The featured segment in the first episode is dedicated to Daniel's dearly departed dog Castro, and they also include a bit that makes fun of parents reuniting with their deceased children in VR. The pandemic likely plays a big part in this, but Daniel looks tired and just seems a lot less energetic. He's still doing a good job, but the tone of these first episodes felt dreary. I genuinely hope he's doing okay. On more than one occasion, Daniel doesn't refer to the show as being cancelled, but rather Comedy Central's last season. So yes, Daniel and his team are exploring their options and shopping the show around to find it a new home. If they're able to continue, it could end up on another channel, or a streaming service. It'd be a full circle moment for the show that talks about the internet to end up on it. Given how cheap it is to produce, I'm hoping that studios and networks are willing to give it another chance. A uh, redemption, if you will. As long as internet content is put out into the open, Daniel will continue to adapt and make fun of it. However, if this show ended for good after this 12th season, I wouldn't be too upset. I don't think most people want it to be over with, myself included, but it's been on for 11 years and they've produced nearly 300 episodes. That's a feat most shows have to dream of achieving. I'm grateful that we got over a decade of comedy from it. You can watch tons of clips from the show, new and old, on their official YouTube channel to see how it's evolved over time. Without Tosh.0, I wouldn't have grown nearly as attached to the internet when I was younger. It helped me realize that it was this vast, weird place where anyone, and I mean anyone, can get attention. I attribute so much of who I am to this strange show, and for that, Daniel, we thank you. Thank you guys for watching this, or even clicking on it. I appreciate it big time. I'd love it if you gave this a like, comment, or show any support you can, because I'm almost certain that Viacom CBS is gonna give me some copyright difficulties. They have on almost every other video I've made talking about shows they own, and I don't want this to get buried by the algorithm because of it. Tosh.0 is able to get away with using a bunch of clips under fair use, so I hope I'm able to do the same. Anyways, thank you again so much, and have a spectacular day.